So they started exactly. talking to me about Jesus day and night. And, you know, it was just fascinating. But when I saw their lives starting to change, I thought, I don't like this. Hey, friends, and welcome to today's interview from Jews for Jesus. I'm Jeff Morgan, and today, Dr. Michael Brown will be joining us as we discuss how a young guy that grew up in a nice Jewish home in Long Island becomes a follower of Jesus and the world's leading Jewish apologist. Hey, friends, welcome to our YouTube channel and playlist where we hold rational and logical discussions with leading scholars about the existence of God and Jesus as the Messiah. I'm Jeff Morgan, and I'm part of the Jews for Jesus team here in Israel. I'm excited because today we are welcoming Dr. Michael Brown. He is the host of the nationally syndicated radio broadcast, The Line of Fire, the president of Fire School of Ministry, and the professor of Bible and Hebrew studies at several leading seminaries. He has a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures from New York University, has preached in many countries all over the world, and is the author of 27 books. Correct me if I'm wrong. 42. Uh, 42. You can update the info here. <laughs> 42 books, including the highly acclaimed five-volume series, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, which we will be uh, talking about a little bit in this uh, interview. Commentaries on Jeremiah and Job. And one of my favorites, The Real Kosher Jesus. I got it in Hebrew right here. Uh, Yeshua HaKasher. This is for Echad Bishalano. This is for the Hebrew readers and speakers. Uh, he's written numerous scholarly and pub, uh, popular articles. Dr. Brown is widely considered to be the world's foremost messianic Jewish apologist. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining us here today. How's it going? It's going great, and it's great to be with you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so as a, as a Jewish believer in Jesus, uh, I follow your work. You know, I really appreciate what you do. After coming to faith in Jesus myself as a Jewish person, I wanted to study, um, you know, the scriptures. I wanted, to, I wanted to know my faith intellectually. I wanted to intellectually understand it. It wasn't enough for me to just feel like what I was believing was right anymore. You know, after 20 years of new age spirituality, I had enough of that, you know, just being guided by my feelings. Um, I wanted to know and love God with my mind and not just with my heart. So your work has been uh, essential for me. So thank you for that. But before we get into our conversation, I'm an athlete and I have education in fitness and nutrition. And I want to know. Dr. Brown, how, how you got into such great shape? You made an awesome trans transformation. What, what did you do? Really, the Lord intervened in my life because I, I had been a chocoholic pretty much all my life. Uh, I loved pizza and other unhealthy things that uh, probably in the course of a year, I'd have fruit just a, a few times and maybe like watermelon or something like that. And yeah, yeah. I just I was just addicted to unhealthy food. So I was always trying to fight it, you know. I wouldn't have chocolate for a while or I'd, I wouldn't have anything fried or red meat or, you know, but, but I was getting heavier and uh, had high blood pressure and, you know, different things. And uh, even though I'm almost six, three, I was 275 pounds. So I was, you know, I was way overweight and it's just an unhealthy lifestyle. And I, over the years I'd cried out for, for God to help me. You know, I'd, I said, Lord, let me love broccoli the way I love chocolate. But it would never happen. <laughs> of course, I never ate the broccoli either to help make it happen. And in uh, 2014, my wife Nancy really got burdened for me and really cried out and kept praying. And I came to a point, I told her on August 23rd of 2014, my plan is not working, which was code for us. You know, it was a, a long story behind it, but it was code for us to say, okay, you know, cutting back a little on this, cutting back, a little, it's, it's not working. I need to make a radical change. The problem was how. The foods I really needed to eat, I, I didn't like. The, the, the foods I wanted to eat, I was addicted to. I'm traveling around the world. How am I going to do this? But she said, okay, nothing passes through your lips without my approval. I'm going to tell you okay. exactly what to eat. And, and she had been studying nutrition for years. It had made a change in her own life. So yeah. that next day, went cold turkey and just started eating the healthy foods that she gave me. And that now is, is over seven and a half years ago. And by God's grace, uh, haven't deviated from it. Uh, no cheat days. You know, when people say to me, oh, you know, how often do you, do you cheat? I said, how often do you cheat on your spouse? You know, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a non-negotiable for me. That's right. That's but right. once I realized, uh, uh, initially, it was miserable. I went through yeah. three miserable days of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And God set me free from shooting heroin and other drugs 
when I got right. saved in 71, that was easy. He just set me free. I was, I was done. This was miserable. <laughs> Three miserable days of withdrawal. The third night, I cried out to God. I, I said, God, you, you were so real to me back then that I didn't care about drugs. or anything. I said, surely the power of the spirit is, is, is greater than the power of, of a chocolate glazed donut. You know? and <laughs> so you know, things broke then. Then it was a matter of renewing my mind. Be, because yeah. you have to think differently about food. You have to relate to it differently. I realized food was my reward. It was my built-in reward in everything that I did. And I had to change, you know, because constantly pushing, traveling, you know, so food, eat, that's one thing you can do. So yeah. God gave me grace just by eating totally healthily. I had been exercising before. I kept up exercising. I went from 275 pounds to 180 pounds in less than eight months. Uh, wow. My blood pressure went from a high of 149 over 103 to about uh, maybe like 105 over 65. Okay. My cholesterol, which had been as high as 230, but the real bad thing was the bad was high and the good was low. Yeah. That completely reversed, went down to the 130s and everything shifted there. Wow. I used to have maybe three headaches a week, maybe more. Uh, haven't had a headache, virtually no headaches in seven and a half years. I had constant lower back pain. That disappeared. Uh, yep. And, you know, my energy level off the charts. So it's just, it's been amazing. And, yeah, and honestly, yeah. as, as we, when I, when I got COVID a few weeks ago and it, it affected my heart, so we, we, you know, had to just look at some things. And when, when the doctors were looking at my heart, we saw some other things that were probably the fruit of the way I had lived in the past. Right. And I, I really believe not just that God has changed my life and given me a new quality of life, but that I, I, I could have well died of a heart attack from some yeah. other, you know, because of the high blood pressure and the way I lived, I pushed so hard. So God helped me. It's that simple. God intervened. My wife and I wrote a book called Breaking the Stronghold of Food. And, wow. uh, you know, we, we keep getting good reports of people being impacted by it. But just like I don't take credit for my salvation, I don't take credit for this. The discipline right. God gave me, the, the grace, the change. He yep. just intervened. It's that simple. No, oh, praise God for that. Um, yes, uh, I made a radical trans uh, transition or transformation about uh, eight years ago as well. Um, changed my diet completely. I went, actually went on a plant based diet. Uh, and that was incredible. Yeah, right? same here. Yeah, uh, great. So um, yeah, it just did wonders for me. All my numbers changed. All my my inflammation went away, and I still had some lingering issues because I I just messed my body up for so many years. And yep. Um, after coming to faith, um, I really realized how important having the energy um, and the and, and a pain free existence to be able to raise my kids mm. and share yeah. with them, you know, and, and lead them to the Lord, you know, as as time goes on and to play with them and to make life fun for them. And, you know, it's it's all been so much more benefit. And I've tried actually a couple of times going back on animal products. And I'm not here to recommend a plant based diet. I'm just saying um, it. I just. I just started going back to the way I used to feel, you know, inflamed and in pain. And um, my, my cholesterol was high. But I, anyway, I was just impressed with your, your transformation. So thanks for sharing that with us. So let's talk about another transformation. And I would say the most important transformation. You're a Jewish guy growing up in a nice Jewish home in Long Island. How does this Jewish kid go from a Jewish home to believing in Jesus or, or you know, how we call him here in Israel, uh, Yeshua, um, you know, to go from believing in him as the Messiah, the Son of God, Savior of the world, and not only that, becoming the world's foremost Messianic Jewish apologist. Yeah, you know, as as for the the title, world's foremost Messianic Jewish apologist, I, I used to tell people it's like playing center on the pygmy basketball team. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, I, I used to say, yeah, number one among one. Uh, but but <laughs> see, that's that's part of the story. And thank God for many others being raised up and, and making great right. con contributions. But um. I was I was a product of the counterculture revolution of the 60s. So I grew up in a very liberal Jewish home called conservative Judaism. It was very wishy-washy. Uh, you know, we go to here uh, on your average Sabbath, they barely have 10 men uh, for a minion, you know, for the prayer service. But on the high holy days, they had to build an annex that seated maybe three or four hundred because all those people would come for the high holy days. So it, it was a very nominal Judaism for me. So we absolutely knew we were Jews, and, and there was a pride in that, but it was nominal. We, we weren't religious Jews. So I was bar mitzvah at 13, but I learned to chant the, the passage in Hebrew, didn't even know what I was reading. 
And it didn't dawn on anyone to sit down and say, let's read this in English and see, it was just a matter of learning to chant the Hebrew. And, and then uh, when, when I was bar mitzvah, it was much more of a social event for me than a spiritual event. But I, I started playing drums when I was eight, born in 55, to give you context. The Beatles came to America when I was nine. So the whole rock scene was now growing. And I, I went to see my first rock concert when I was 13. That was later that same year. So Jimi Hendrix in concert. And that was a far more impacting event for me than my bar mitzvah. Because the whole rock scene appealed to me and the, the rebellion of it and the, everything about it appealed to me. When I was 14, someone asked me if I wanted to smoke pot. And I thought, well, you're not supposed to. So, you know, in Proverbs 9, uh, the, the voice of foolishness says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is delicious. You know, the stuff you can't have. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and then I thought, well, all the rock stars do it. So I'm going to try getting high. Uh, but when I smoked pot, it had no effect on me. Something about my body seemed to have a high resistance to drugs. So, you know, tried a harder drug. And that had no effect on me. So I went to a harder drug. So, so very quickly, I was doing ups, downs, LSD. By the time I was 15, I was shooting heroin. And people think, oh, you're strung out in the streets. No, I was living at home. My dad was the senior lawyer in the New York Supreme Court. You know, my mom and dad super happily married. My, my sister, a little older, she was off at college. And I was just enjoying life. I, I enjoyed getting high. It was playing in a, in a rock band. And we had all these great aspirations, who we, we were going to be. And, and our, our, our favorite song, the, peop the song that people liked best, was called Dance of the Mushroom Man. So that, right. that may have some meaning for, you. for the older viewers. There's a saying, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. So uh, enough said. So uh, my two best friends like these two girls. And the two girls... Uh, had, had a, a dad who had been praying for them for years and an uncle who was a pastor. So the girls started going to church. It was just the early season of what we call the Jesus People Movement. All these hippies, radicals, rebels from around the world got, got drawn in. If you look at the early days of the Jews for Jesus tracks, a lot of these people were former hippies. You can see it in what they drew and how they communicated. So they started going to the church. My friends started going to hang out with the girls. And because it was Pentecostal, it was different. It was interesting. And teaching on end time prophecy in the book of Revelation, that got their interest. So they started talking to me about Jesus day and night. And, you know, it was just fascinating. But when I saw their lives starting to change, I thought, I don't like this. We're supposed to be rock stars. You know, what's this? So I went to the church in August of 71, intending to mock it, to, you know, expose how stupid it was and all of that. And the people were just so loving to me, you know, long haired hippie kid rebel. And they, they were just loving, gracious, older people. And, and I thought, Oh, whatever you have your religion. I have mine and you live how you want. I'll live how I want. But they started praying for me. I didn't know it, but they started praying for me and the Holy spirit started convicting me. It was the weirdest thing because I'd lay in bed high on drugs at night. I used to be called drug bear and iron man because of the crazy quantities of drugs I could use. And, it's a wow. foolish teenager that became my identity. And I'd lay in bed at night thinking how cool I was. Did these drugs, stole money from my father. He doesn't know it. Ripped off my yeah. friends. They don't know it. And now the next night I'm laying in bed and I'm tormented by the very, the very same thoughts I was boasting about yesterday. I'm tormented about today. What kind of person are you? So I didn't know it was prayer. For me. I didn't know it was the conviction of the spirit. So fun in November of 71, I went back to a service. And at that service for the first time, it's like a light went on and I realized I did believe Jesus died for my sins. I did believe he rose from the dead. I responded to an altar call, just, you know, thinking the people will think it's cool. I didn't even mean it. But as I was saying the words, I realized I do believe this. And the problem was I wasn't willing to repent. I wasn't willing to, to turn from my drugs. So I said, Lord, when I go home tonight, you know, or God, I don't know how I addressed him, you know when I go home tonight, that, that I'm going to sh uh, shoot cocaine and, and smoke angel dust. You know I'm going to do that. Yeah. So if you don't want me to do it, don't let it have any effect on me. And I went home, smoked this large quantity of PCP angel dust, shot a good amount of cocaine, and nothing happened. And I thought, something's going on here. And for five weeks, I went back and forth. In church one day, shooting heroin the next. In church one day, getting high all day the next. Finally, December 17th of 71. Now, remember, I used to go to rock concerts all the time. I saw Hendrix again. I saw Zeppelin multiple times, Grateful Dead, Jethro Tull, 
10 years <laughs> ago, big bands, you know, Doors, Janis Joplin. I saw so many of them. The music's so loud, you can't even hear yourself think. I'm in this little church, and, and the pastor's wife's playing piano, and we're singing these little ditty hymns. Right. You know, there's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low, make me a blessing. And I get overcome with joy, a joy I've never known. And, and in an instant, just like when you're in a car accident and your life passes before, in an instant, I, I thought of every good experience, every high, every joy I had from a sports high to a friendship high to doing good high to drug, all the drug highs. And I thought, this is of a different quality. This must be what they call the joy of the Lord. And right then, I got a revelation of God's love. And, and it's, it's as if, I, I mean, I saw in my mind's eye, I saw myself filthy from head to toe. I saw the blood of Jesus wash me clean from head to toe and, and put these beautiful white robes on me. And then I was going back and playing in the mud. And right then and there, I said, God, I will never put a needle in my arm again. And was free from that moment on, instantly transformed. When my dad saw the change in my life, he was thrilled. But then he said to me, Michael, I'm glad to see you're off drugs, but we're Jews. We don't believe this. You need to talk to the local rabbi. So that's how the whole Jewish apologetic thing started. I, you know, I got radically born again, you know, started to read the word and pray and, and really dig in, you know, just reading my English Bible, King James, the little Hebrew I knew I'd completely forgotten. And immediately talking to this rabbi who then brought me to meet other rabbis. And it, I was always happy to witness and share my faith, but they raised all kinds of questions I didn't have answers for. And I had, I had no point of reference. I didn't know other Jewish believers. I didn't know any Christian scholars. Uh, there was no really developed apologetics at that point for, to, to go to. So it's like I got thrown in the deep end the, right as a brand new believer and had to go through the struggles and go through the, the questions and the agony and is what I believe really true. And I came to the determination, Jeff, that, that as a, and this was after meeting with uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews, Hasidic rabbis and spending hours with them and seeing their lives and hearing their answers, I said, God, I must be a loyal Jew in your sight. And, and if, that, if that means renouncing Jesus, if it means everything I believe these years is wrong, and every friend I have in this whole community I have to leave behind, I'll do it to honor you. But if what I believe is true, if what I believe is true, then I don't care if the whole Jewish world rejects me. I have to follow you and be a loyal Jew. And I remember being in such pain, I thought, you're supposed to pray in Jesus' name. But if I pray in Jesus' name, I'm prejudicing my prayer. But if I don't pray in Jesus' name, will God actually hear my prayer? I mean, that, that's the, the level of, of pain I was in. But it, it, it was after praying prayers like that that the truth became all the more overwhelmingly clear. I mean, right between my eyes that, that God, through his word, reaffirmed to me the truth of what I believe. And, and one reason I, I wrote all the books and have done all the apologetics and debates, obviously I want to reach out to our people. But the first reason I put these materials together was to help other Jewish believers so that they would not have to go through what I went through and, and mm -hmm. did the research and, and did the digging and, and got the degrees and, and spent time on my knees, hopefully to, to produce things that would be solid and that could be used for the salvation of our people and for the edification of those who believe. Yes. Well, I, I've used actually your uh, literature to, to help me when I first came to faith. My, 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 uh, transformation and it was four years ago just four and years wow just four years but i'll tell you i was seeking for 20 years mm. and i was i was praying i didn't know who i was praying to but i i literally when i came to faith and my burdens fell off my shoulders i mean torment mm. and suicidal thoughts and depression and anxiety when those fell off me with no effort of my own mm. dr brown i wept for a year really? years of joy I, every day I was crying and putting my hands up in the air. I was the guy in the front row at church like, yes, because I'd never felt that way before. Yeah. And I was trying. I mean, you know, with, through, through New Age uh, uh, practice, there's meditation and positive affirmations and spiritual affirmations. And, and 
10 years go by, 15 years go by, 20 years go by, and life's getting worse. And our, our family is in debt, and we've got problems and, and these issues that I can't get rid of and this spiritual torment that I couldn't shake. And I'll tell you, I was, I was weeping for a year, which is why I picked up your literature right away. So I, I want to talk about how a Jewish person even considers believing Jesus. I mean, not talking about you and I, how, how does a Jewish person even consider Jesus as Messiah? After hearing their whole life to stay away from the New Testament, that Jesus is not for the Jews, Christians persecuted the Jews, therefore stay away from anything they try to teach you. I mean, that's what I was taught growing up. But but we study the Tanakh, the five books of Moses, the prophets and the writings, and it's all there. Um, we've also had personal experiences with Jesus. So the question would be for those that are watching, how does a Jewish person get through those barriers and through what lens should a Jewish person be reading their scriptures? I mean, through the lens of the neighborhood conservative rabbi, through the lens of Rashi and the rabbinic commentary, uh, through the lens of the Christian pastor? I mean, what do you say? Right. So we have to realize that the Jewish community is diverse. In yeah. America, probably 90%, maybe, maybe slightly lower than that, but roughly 90% are not Orthodox. So the vast majority of American Jews are not strictly observing the Sabbath. They're not keeping the dietary laws. Right. They're not that religious themselves. Now, the, the religious population is, is growing. And one reason being that the, the, the liberal side of Judaism doesn't have that much of a hold on people. It's, it's, it's not deep enough for many. But if you're talking about a very religious Jew, maybe 15% of the Israeli population is Haredi, so ultra-Orthodox, uh, that's a whole different world yeah. than a secular Jew that is pro-abortion, pro-homosexual marriage, and right. has never read much of the Bible in, in his life. So you're talking about a diverse community, but it's not just that Jesus has been outside of, of our realm, just like a Christian doesn't believe in Muhammad, a Jew doesn't believe in Jesus, but uh, church history has been bloody and filled with persecution of Jews, even, even killing of Jews in Jesus' name, uh, many religious Jews think there's a straight line from the New Testament to the Holocaust. Right. So there's a lot to overcome. Yeah. The more secular a Jewish person is, probably the less they care about those things. They may be into New Age like you were. Uh, they may be a Jew, you know, a Jewish Buddhist. They may be an atheist. Right. There's a higher percentage of Jewish atheists than atheists in the general population in America. So that person may not have as much resistance. And if you can separate Jesus from Christendom, they might even be interested in finding out who this guy is because he's very influential and a miracle worker. For right, right. A, a more religious Jew, there are more obstacles to overcome. So where we start, though, is that he's a Jew, that, that he was not the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ, <laughs> excuse me, that Christ is just the Jewish way of, of saying Messiah, that his name was Yeshua, his mother's name was Miriam. Even the concept of a, of a Brit Hadashah in New Testament goes back to the prophet Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. So to try to say he's one of us, right. as, as the, uh, the Hebrew translation of Real Kosher Jesus says in the subtitle, Echad Nishalanu, one of us. So that's, right. that's, that's where you want to start. And, and then you always want with every person to help them come to grips with their own sin, to recognize that we're not as good as we normally think we are, right. to, to get us to understand our guilt before God, and then to show why the Messiah was sent, and then to open up the Hebrew Scriptures, to say, hey, let, let's not worry about the New Testament. Let's just see who's spoken of here in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, I, I was talking to a, a woman who was raised in Chabad, so Lubavitch uh, Hasidism, you know, ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Um, one of her, uh, let's see, it was her grandmother that basically lost all her family in the Holocaust and years later jumped out of a window and killed herself with, with this granddaughter in the room when it happened. Um, so there was a lot of pain in her life, in her upbringing. I, I can't imagine the things that she went through. And, and I said to her, you know, doesn't it make sense that our Messiah suffered? Doesn't it make sense that, that he came into our world and was rejected and, and hated? 
And you try to open up the concept of a suffering Messiah based on scripture. Uh, you, you demonstrate that there were two phases to his work, priestly work by which he died for our sins and then ruling and reigning as king when he returns. And, and God opens hearts and minds. God convicts of sin. And that's why there, there are several hundred thousand people like you and me, Jews who believe in Jesus around the world, and, and why there's, there's always been a remnant. We've been small in number compared to the whole Jewish population, but we've been here through history. So, you know, there are many things to overcome, you know, views of God. Do we believe in three gods and, and other things yeah, like that? Of course, you know, address those in depth in, in writing and debate and video. But, you know, just some of the starting points are there, get them to understand, hey, hey he, he's one of us. Here, I'll tell you a quick, quick joke. At Harvard University and it's graduation, guys are getting their bachelor's degrees and there's a Jewish dad and a Catholic dad, they're sitting and chatting. The Jewish dad says to the Catholic dad, so what's your boy gonna do after college? He goes, oh, he's very, very devout, very religious. Uh, he is, uh, uh, he's gonna go to seminary, become a priest. And, and the Jewish dad said, that's it, the priest? And the Catholic dad's a little surprised. He goes, no, I mean, he's, he's a fine man. He's very devout. I, I don't know, you know, maybe one day he could become a bishop. And Jewish dad said, a bishop? That's it? So Catholic dad's a little perturbed at this point. He said, well, well I, I don't know. Maybe one day he'll, he'll be a cardinal. And the Jewish dad says, a cardinal? That's it? So Catholic dad's angry at this point. He goes, I don't know. Maybe one day he'll be the pope. And the Jewish dad says, the pope? That's it? So the Catholic dad's absolutely exasperated. He goes, what do you want him to be, God? And the Jewish dad said, one of our boys made it. <laughs> That's right. So uh, <laughs> obviously, yeah, let's get past the theology of one of our boys made it. But that's you want a Jewish person to recognize, hey, that's one of us. Yes. And we've been hated and persecuted, rejected. He understands. He went, but he did it for us when he himself was perfect. Yes. All the, all the previous prophets were also uh, rejected as well by the people. So let's get into some uh, general Jewish objections to Jesus. Yeah. Um, the number of Jewish believers, like you said, is, is, uh, is growing. The number of Jesus, uh, sorry, Jewish believers in Jesus is growing rapidly today, especially here in Israel. But the number worldwide, like we just spoke about, is relatively low. So um, why, why don't more Jewish people today believe in Jesus? I don't know if this is like the same kind of question that we just talked about. Yeah, the first reason is the vast majority of Jewish people never consider him. Right. It's, it's not an option that, that they think about. How come you've never been to this restaurant? I didn't know it existed. So, again, I remember talking with my friends at Hebrew school one day prior to our bar mitzvahs. And, and we were talking about Christians, Catholic, Gentile. We said, you know, it's all the same. So that was our world. We didn't have, you know, Muslims, Hindus, right in our community. So if you're, you're a Gentile, you're a Catholic, you're a Christian, it's all the same. That's them. And this is us. So it's, it's not anything that, that your average Jew considers. Like I said, just like Christians don't believe in Muhammad. If you right. ask your average Christian, why aren't you a Muslim? It's like, because I'm a Christian. That's right. You know, that's have you ever read the Quran? No. Why would I? I'm a Christian. Exactly. Uh, that the baggage of church history that we mentioned yeah. uh, and, and then the perception that it's a different religion. That's In right. other words, Jew, Sabbath, Torah, synagogue, Christian, Sunday, church, you know, just, just very different. So those would be some of the fundamental issues. Right. Uh, and then the more religious you are, you've the little that you know about Yeshua is, is that he was some, sorcerer some magician or some evil guy that led israel astray and that the sanhedrin put to death because of it so right. you know it's a lot of baggage to overcome there god god does overcome it but but it, it's not like well we studied we investigated we we looked at this and we concluded that he's not the messiah it's like we never looked never thought about right. it right that's right Good point. I've heard many of my Jewish brothers and sisters when approached with the idea of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah say, well, you Christians have your religion. We Jews have ours. You know, we're happy with ours. So leave us alone, basically. It, it, 
If what they say is true and Jesus isn't for the Jews, what does that say actually about Christianity? It's for nobody. It's, it's all a sham. It's all a myth. Nobody should believe in there's Jesus. No, there's no we have ours and you have yours. If, 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 we don't, if they don't have theirs, if we don't have ours, if Jesus isn't for the Jews, then... Yeah, it, look, if, if Jesus came into the world and his mission was to be a prophet to the Gentile world, to enlighten the Gentile world about the one true God, and to make a way for the Gentiles to worship this God because the Jews already had their covenant, that would be one thing. But that's not what the New Testament says. The New Testament claims from beginning to end, from the very first verses right to the end, that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, that Yeshua came to fulfill the prophecies, that he came first for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and then from there to the Gentile world. Every, every strand of text, every, every subtext tells the same thing, brings the same identical message. So if he's not the Messiah of Israel, then he's not the savior of the world. Yeah. Either he was deceived or, or he was an imposter or his followers were deceived. I, I was talking to an Orthodox rabbi who works a lot with the Christian world and is very positive on the message of Jesus and how it brings the, the knowledge of the God of Israel to the rest of the world and how redemptive and wonderful it is. So I asked him, did Jesus rise from the dead? He said, no. I said, so we are believing a lie. Our entire faith in the people suffering for the gospel around the world, we are all believing a lie and God, according to you, is backing this lie because in the process, the people get to know who he is. So it's, you know, it's, it's okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's really an utterly outrageous idea. If he rose from the dead, then everyone should follow him, Jew and Gentile alike. If he didn't rise from the dead, no one should. So it's <laughs> either or. It really okay. is either or. Well put. So growing up in a Jewish household and around Jewish communities, the general motto for the Jewish person uh, today is just to be a good person, you know, do mitzvot, good deeds, and, and make the world a better place. You know, don't get me wrong, this is a good thing. But it seems that um, most Jewish people have completely ignored the concept of getting right with God or atonement for sin. Uh, many Jewish people think that we don't need a mediator or a high priest, so to speak, uh, to have our sins forgiven. They believe that repentance, prayer, good deeds... Uh, is enough to be right with God. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, a, a traditional Jew is praying for mercy every day. A, a traditional Jew has a consciousness of sin as well as this desire to do good. But yes, the traditional Jew does not believe that blood sacrifices are needed. A traditional Jew does not believe that there has to be a, a substitute taking our place. And then on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, even non-traditional Jews will often go to synagogue and fast. And a traditional Jew will be in synagogue pretty much all that night and, and all that next day. And, and you'll be saying these prayers, confessing sin over and over. Al Chet is one of the, the key prayers that's prayed uh, together with the rest of the people of Israel. You're confessing you know, every kind of sin. You're beating your breast. You're asking God for mercy. But the problem is that the fundamental things that God set in place in the Torah with substitution, with the high priest mediating, with blood sacrifice, none of those are there. So the, the question is, why were they so important? You can, you can read the five books of Moses and, and we start to get into the, the legislation. So, you know, Exodus 20 is when the Ten Commandments come. And, and you, you start reading there and then read into Deuteronomy, and over and over and over and over, there's teaching about the building of the tabernacle. There's the importance of priestly ministry. There's law after law about Leviticus. Start, start reading Leviticus 1, chapter after chapter after chapter about blood. Why? Why is this so important? Why is this so crucial? Conversely, you see almost nothing about repentance. We all agree on the importance of repentance, but very, very little in these chapters about repentance because God is establishing human guilt, needs a substitute. Human guilt needs a substitute. Blood for blood, life for life. We're guilty in God's sight. Our life is forfeit. We need mercy. 
God brings a substitute. And the animal sacrifices were a constant lesson pointing to ultimately passages like Isaiah 53. So, you know, Isaiah 53, 6 that I've quoted endlessly in Hebrew and English that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. And the Lord laid on him, Yeshua, the iniquity, the guilt of all of us. So that is so crucial. And I, I, I know that the experience of forgiveness that we had with, as, as we've talked about, it, the joy, the, the weeping in God's presence, the, the amazement that your sins are forgiven, there, this sense of liberation, and now even a, a power you have inside of you to, to say no to sin and, 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 and to, to live a godly yeah. life. The thing that we experience is precious and sacred and real. The, the new birth is precious and sacred and real. And to those that are riddled with guilt and to those who, who struggle day and night with, you know, knowing you're unclean, it's like you're trying to scratch under your skin and you can't, you can't get to that itch. It's a spiritual thing. And, and praying all day and, and trying to have your good deeds outweigh your bad, because that's what a traditional Jew is ultimately doing. You know, during these holidays in the month of Tishrei, the, you know, the holiest time of the year in the Jewish calendar, the astrological sign for that is, is, is balances, weights. Your life is being weighed in the balance. Your good deeds have to outweigh your bad. And, and even if a traditional Jew loves God as best as he understands and believes that God loves him and, and is not living in constant legalism, still, it's, it's on you ultimately to kind of tip the scales and hope for mercy. No, no, Yeshua paid it all. And that does not give us a license to sin. Rather, it liberates us from sin to live for him. Amen. That's right. Uh, let's get into some um, historical objections to Jesus. And, and just as a reminder, Dr. Brown has published a five-volume series called Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. The link to that can be found in the description below. So some historical objections. If Jesus really is for the Jews, why have so many atrocities been committed on our Jewish people in the name of Jesus? First, it's completely inexcusable. Uh, yeah. th this is a terrible history. It's undeniable. And it, it really starts to grow once Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire in the, in the fourth century. Because up until then, yeah, there, there were polemics and there may have been some demonizing of the Jewish people by some church leaders, but there are no laws being passed. There's no discriminatory action because the Christians themselves were heavily persecuted in a minority. But what happened, as inexcusable as it is, my most translated book focuses on church history through Jewish eyes. It's called Our Hands Are Stained With Blood. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've written about it and sought to educate the church. Paul warned about it. Paul warned Gentile believers in Rome not to become arrogant, not to forget their Jewish roots, not to dishonor the, the, the Jewish people. And when, when the church became arrogant because of ignorance and developed this theology that we call replacement theology or supersessionism, it said that the, the church superseded Israel, the church replaced Israel, the church was the new Israel, that once this was being taught, uh, it, it, and then as, as much of the church fell away from the Bible, in other words, you had a small remnant of real believers and a large outward church that had very little connection to the church, just like through Israelite history. You had the whole nation of Israel, but only a remnant really serving God. It's been the same with church history, that the, the people right. that persecuted Jews, the people that gave the Jews the choice of baptism or death, they were no more Christian than the man in the moon. They right. probably never read the Bible in their own lives. That's so a good point. what we have yeah, to do yeah. is say what happened was horrific and inexcusable, right. but also throughout church history, you find a steady stream of great love for the Jewish people, of, of people willing to, to sacrifice for the Jewish people. You see, you know, right through the Holocaust, the Corrie Ten Booms and these others, right. the righteous Gentiles, uh, most of the people who, who did what they did sacrificially to save Jewish lives did it because they were Christian. Those were the real Christians in the midst of things. And what's also interesting, as, as I've traveled the world, I've been overseas more than 150 trips. I've been to countries like India 27 times, uh, would have been 29 if not for COVID. Uh, so, you know, been around the world, you know, been in, in South Korea, been in Japan and China and the Philippines and 
you know, a lot of places that are anything but Western Christian. Uh, and, and when I share some of this history right, in, in Africa, you know, different places, when I share some of this history, they're shocked. Yeah. They've never heard of it. Mm-hmm. They pray regularly for Israel. They love Israel. I, I remember an Iranian Christian saying to me, anyone who hates the Jews is not a Christian. Right. They're mortified. So right. this has been a phenomenon, especially in Anglo Christianity. And, and what we have to say is, look, it's aberrant. It's terrible. It's inexcusable. But who, who are Israel's best friends today? Evangelical Christians. Why? Because they take the Bible literally, and therefore they love Israel and the Jewish people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I've been sharing uh, Jesus with someone very close to me for, for quite a while now. And I had him read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to know what his takeaway was. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it, it really surprised me. He said, I, what I got from the book was how few real Christians there probably really are in the world. And I said, wow. Mm. I said, I, I wanted you to get something different from the book, but you know what? Great insight. And, and that just talks about that just hits on what you just what you just talked about. Yeah, I, I remember when I was invited to debate the, the rabbi that had befriended me as a new believer. Now it's years later, I was getting my doctorate, and he, he invited me to do some debates with him in his synagogue. And uh, I remember him saying publicly, one of the things I learned from Michael is that most of the people that call themselves Christians are not really Christian. Yeah. Uh, right. So, you know, that's, look, it's, it's a reality. God tells Elijah, I have 7,000 in Israel who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. That's a tiny percentage of the population, but that's how bad Israel was. So when you look at certain parts of church history, and dominated by a, a major traditional church that has its own armies and kingdom and stuff like that. There's only a small remnant there that's Christian. And, and you have Christians around the world, but a lot of that story wasn't told. Uh, right, you know, right, a, right. a lot of the story of African Asian Christianity, some of the key centers got wiped out in the 13th century with the, the rise and spread of Islam. And, and that history was very different. So we, ha- we have to try to find the true church in the midst of a lot of this. Yeah. Another objection is that the, the New Testament is anti-Semitic. Could the way that Jewish leaders uh, are portrayed, could it, like the, you know how, how the Jewish leaders were portrayed in the New Testament, lead people to anti-Semitism? And how should the New Testament be read to avoid this? Right. So the New Testament is absolutely not anti-Semitic. But if you read the Old Testament a certain way, you could conclude that the Old Testament is anti-Semitic. The same with the New. In other words, in the Old Testament, God says about Israel, Israel stiff-necked, that the Gentiles will listen to the message of the prophets, but the Jews won't because they're stiff-necked and hard-hearted, that they're always a rebellious people. If I got up today and made those statements publicly, I would be rightly branded an anti-Semite. If I just got up and said, all the Jews are stiff-necked and hard-hearted and rebels and this and this and this and this. So... Uh, if you read the Dead Sea Scrolls or the writings of Josephus, so these are writings from around the time of Jesus, a little bit before, a little bit after, and you see the inter-Jewish polemic, far, far harsher than anything that you see in the New Testament. It's, it's shocking. This is one Jewish group attacking another Jewish group. So what you have in the so New it's Testament, a family dispute. yeah, it, it's, these are inter-family disputes, absolutely. And that's what you have in the New Testament. Jesus himself says salvation is of the Jews. Uh, you've got you know, wonderful verses like that. Paul says the law is holy, just, and good. Uh, the New Testament confirms the promises to the patriarchs, and the Messiah confirms the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. doesn't cancel them. Uh, the, the ultimate city where we live forever is called the New Jerusalem. Yeshua is coming back to Jerusalem, according to the New Testament. And on and on it goes. The New Testament declares that all Israel shall be saved at the end and that God's promises to Israel are irrevocable. So you have all these wonderful words. In the midst of it, there are polemics against corrupt leaders. There are polemics against, just like the prophets uh, polemicized against their corrupt leaders. But this is is Jew speaking to to Jew. And, And the verses that have been taking you, well, Paul was writing to Gentiles and sounded anti-Semitic. When you rightly understand them, and I break this down in, in volume one 
of answering Jewish objections to Jesus, when you just rightly understand it, not, not doing all kinds of interpretive contortions, but you see, ah, not, not anti-Semitic at all. Like Paul tells the Thessalonians, these Gentile Christians who've been suffering at the hands of their own people, he says, yeah, we've suffered at the hands of our own countrymen too. These Jews who, who killed the prophets and have crucified the Messiah and are always displeasing God. He's not talking about all Jews. He's talking about the, 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 the Jews in Jerusalem, the bad apples that they had a bad time with and, and that were involved in crucifying the Messiah. That's what he's talking about. It's like, yeah, you're suffering from your countrymen. We, we're the same too. We got these bad apples. So there's nothing anti-Semitic about it. And the proof of the pudding is that when you have all these Gentile Christians around the world who read the, the Bible and, and read it as literally as it's intended to be read, right? Uh, you know, these, these conservative Christians getting born again at these large numbers all around the world, they, they're friends of Israel. They pray yeah. for Israel. I mean, I remember being, what to me was a jungle in India, and meeting people said, oh, we love the Jews. I was the first Jew they ever met. We pray for Israel 20 years. We celebrate the feast. You know, I'm in Kenya, and some guy meets some guy named Shadrach, and, and, and he says his whole mission is, is to help the Church of Kenya bless Israel and pray for Israel. He had a backpack filled with cassette tapes he was giving out. It was like 1989. I've run into this around the world. Where did it come from? From reading the Bible. So uh, when you do, you, it'll produce philo-Semitism. The last thing is, is you mentioned the real kosher Jesus. You, you held it up in Hebrew. So I have one chapter, and in the chapter, I take quotes from, from different prophetic books, Isaiah, Ezekiel. I take the words of God from the Torah, and then I take some of Yeshua's words from the New Testament, and I just have quotes. I don't say who said what. But try to figure out who said it. Was this Yeshua? Was this right. God speaking? Was this Isaiah, right. Jeremiah? And the harshest, most extreme quotes are from God himself and from the Old Testament prophets. Yeshua's words seem mild in comparison, but you have to put everything in its right context. This is a, pr a prophet coming and rebuking his people in the tradition that we've had for centuries. Yeah. Well, talking about the Jewishness of, of the New Testament, I actually came to faith before I actually read the New Testament, which was a miracle in and of itself. Not even getting past the first sentence of the of the of the first book, first verse of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, where I saw the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua Hamashiach, son of David, son of Abraham, and I was like, "You can't get any other more Jewish than this." I mean, <laughs> I, I said it just drew me right in. So I. I, uh, I I met an Israeli years ago, strong believer, and uh, even though he wasn't religious, kind of like a superstitious thing, he would always have the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, with him. You know, so he's an IDF, you get one, and so he'd keep it with him, but wasn't religious. One day, he's given Brit Shah, New Testament, and starts, so he's reading in Hebrew, reading the genealogy of Jesus in Hebrew, and gets born again. Right the, light, the light goes on. Now, just because it's Jewish doesn't mean it's true. Right. But, uh, you know, so you have to study, determine that it's true. But people are shocked. The, there, there is a large percentage of verses in the New Testament that either quote the Hebrew Bible or allude to it or presuppose it. The book of Revelation has a little over 400 verses, I believe 404 total verses. Some scholars estimate that as many as 278 of the 404 verses are drawn from imagery in the Hebrew Bible. Mm. It's, it's that intertwined. You cannot make a separation. Yeah. Um, so we're still into historical objections. Let's talk about the Holocaust, a uh, very sensitive subject. Because of our exposure to so many Jewish believers in Jesus here at Jews for Jesus, some of which are first and second hand generation Holocaust survivors, we can see that the Holocaust is not a rational reason to reject Jesus. But to those out there that are watching that say because of the Holocaust and what happened to our Jewish people at the hands of those claiming to be Catholics and Christians, there's no way that I will ever believe in Jesus. What do you say to them? Well, first, the suffering is unimaginable. You know, right. it's just it's beyond comprehension. On a certain level, you just have to put your hand on your mouth and weep. Uh, the, the rabbi that befriended me once said to me, Michael, I, I can't explain the Holocaust with God. 
but I can't explain the Holocaust without God. You know, when you were talking about two out of every three European Jews slaughtered, when you're talking about a million and a half children and babies, when you're talking about nine out of every 10 Polish Jews slaughtered, I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible. And the question of where was God, and, and then this was an allegedly Christian Europe. So, right. it, and, and without 15 centuries of, of growing anti-Semitism that, that bleeds into European Christian anti-Semitism, uh, the Holocaust could not even have taken place. So uh, it has to be approached with, 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 with great care and, and without trite answers. Right. What I would say in the midst of it is, uh, I would point to how, how the Nazis were actually anti-Christian, how they, how they persecuted Christians and, and killed them. And, and those that tried to be true to their faith ended up in the concentration camps. And that the true Christians were the ones trying to, to rescue Jews and help right. Jews. But be, yeah, beyond yeah, that, I, I, would, I would point to Yeshua's suffering. I, I would say he understands. We don't just need some Messiah riding on a white stallion who's going to come in and destroy our enemies. He, he, he suffered everything you could imaginably suffer. He, he was put to death in the most horrific way. But he was completely innocent. He actually understands. He came into our world and is the very one that we need. You know, Elie Wiesel talks about one moving account in the Holocaust where there was a boy, a young boy, that the Nazis hung for some crime, you know, some, something he did against their rules. And because he was so young and, 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 and light in weight, uh, he couldn't, he, he kept, he didn't die. Mm -hmm. He's hanging and he's kicking and he's flailing and he's not enough weight to break his neck. And it's this horrific scene, everyone watching in agony. And someone cries out, where is God? You know, why doesn't he intervene? And the answer shouted back, there he is hanging on the gallows. And it's, it's something that Jewish people can relate to in, in, in an odd way, you know, that, that type of, of concept. And I said, where is God in our suffering? There he is hanging on a cross, uh, suffering, on our, but he's suffering for us and he's doing it willingly. Yeah. Uh, hopefully that's a bridge that can be built to someone that's, that's been through the horrors of the Holocaust or had family that, that were in past generations that there he is, God hanging on the cross, suffering for us. Yeah. Well, we, we've, uh, we've had the, uh, we've been fortunate enough to see um, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust come to faith in Yeshua yeah, here. Yeah. And that's been that's been amazing for me to see. You were mentioning uh, the Ten Boom family. Wasn't Corey Ten Boom's sister? Didn't they? Did they both go to concentration camp? Yeah, they Was both did. Ravensbrück. Yeah, and and the sister died. Right. And and her father died as well. Right. Right. Th yeah, those were Christians. So let's get into some theological objections. Uh, most Jewish people would say believing in Jesus is idolatry. Uh, you Messianic Jews and Christians believe in multiple gods. We believe in one, as it says in the Shema. How do you respond to that? We believe in one God and one God only. We believe in one God who is Echad. The Hebrew word Echad in and of itself does not mean an explicit singularity. You know, the first time it's used is Genesis 1. You have day and night, one day, Yom right. Echad. Uh, so it's the combination of day and night that brings one day. Uh, then you have in Genesis 2 that Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, will become Basar Echad, one flesh. Uh, so you, know, you, you have this usage throughout the Old Testament. One just means one, like our English word, one. And the one God of the Bible, just using the Hebrew Bible, we see sits enthroned in heaven as God. We see that his presence fills the universe. We see that he works among us by his ruach, by his spirit. And we see that at times he reveals himself in human form, right. like in Genesis 18. So are there multiple gods or is there one God sitting enthroned in heaven whom no one can see because of the brightness of his glory, who sometimes makes himself known in human form on the earth, in a human body, 
and who works among us at all times by his Ruach, by his spirit. That's the God that we worship. So Christians develop the theology called Trinity that speak of the Father, the Son, the Spirit. But that's what I just described, the Father hidden in glory that no one can see, the Son who makes him known, and the Spirit who works among us. And it answers the many questions that are posed in Judaism. You know, how can God be infinite and reveal himself to finite human beings? How can he be transcendent and yet imminent? We have the answer. It's Yeshua. So we worship one God and one God only. God does not become a man. A man cannot become God, but God can reveal himself in a person. God can take on human form. So we have the the precursors in the Hebrew Bible, and then the fullness of it in the New Testament where, where the word, the, the very revelation of God comes in human form. And that's why Yeshua can pray to his father be, because there is this relationship of father-son, and yet the son himself is eternal. You say, wow, that's, that's a lot to think about. Well, study Jewish mysticism. The ten spherot, that's even more to think about. Look at the various Jewish ways of where if, if in the Hebrew Bible God is seen, well, it's the glory of God that's seen. I mean, look, one place God says, you can't see me and live, and live. And the other place he says, you see me. You know, come here and it says they saw him. How are both true? It's all through the Son. It's all through Yeshua. That's how it all comes together. We worship yeah, one yeah. God, one God only, and around the world, Jesus has brought hundreds of millions of former idol worshipers out of idolatry to now worship the God of Israel. Mm. Uh, another objection is that the Messiah will be a man, but will not be divine. So there are verses in the Hebrew Bible that do point to a divine Messiah. The best translation of Isaiah 9.5 in Hebrew, 9.6 in English, is, is that the Messiah will be called Peleuetz El Gibor Aviad Star Shalom, which is a series of names, and El Gibor is Mighty God, which is the title of Yahweh in Isaiah 10.21. Uh, in Psalm 45.7, it's, it's, a, it's a, a wedding psalm of the king, but the psalms are, are often foretastes of the Messiah and pictures of the Messiah. And it says, Ki Elohim Olam Ed, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And this is about the king of Israel. Obviously, it can't just refer to him in its fullness. It refers to the Messiah. So mm -hmm. you do have these verses. And then Judaism recognizes a highly exalted Messiah. So our simple question is, what does the Hebrew Bible say? That's our question. Let's put aside the New Testament. What does the Hebrew Bible say? And, and we can point to a divine Messiah in the Hebrew Bible. That being said, the great emphasis is that the Messiah is one of us, that he took on flesh and blood. That's the miracle. That's God, think of this, reaching out his hand to come right in our midst and live among us while still mm. remaining God enthroned in heaven. Mm. All right, Dr. Brown, one last final note to anyone out there watching, especially if they are Jewish. If you go to realmessiah.com, that is our Jewish website, realmessiah.com. Watch some of the debates that I've had with rabbis. So you get both sides. Watch them. Uh, you've got questions. Probably a lot of your questions we've already answered there. We've got written answers. We've got video answers. Uh, find out more about my own testimony. And, and then ask God. God, would you show, maybe you don't even know if God's there. God, if you're there, help me to know it. It's hard for me to believe in God in light of Holocaust or you know, losing my wife to cancer or the divorce I went through. It's hard for me to believe in God. You know, Just be honest. God, if you're there, help, help me to know. And, and if you believe in God, you're a Jewish person, God, help me to follow you as a Jew. Some, something's been wrong in our history. The, the temple's been destroyed for almost 2,000 years. Yeshua said it would happen because we rejected him. He said we'd be scattered around the world in, in, until the fullness of the Gentiles came, and then it was time for, for our return. Jerusalem would be trampled underfoot by the nations. Something's been wrong through our history. It's not a surprise 
that, that we, re we rejected Moses, we rejected the prophets, we went into exile, we came back, then we rejected the Messiah, we went back into exile. There's a reason, but God desires to have mercy. There is a way for your sins to be forgiven. There is a way for you to be intimate with God. There is a way for you to know what happens to you when you die. There is a way that you can bring a message of hope and light to the rest of the world as a faithful Jew. So explore, study, dig, pray, and you will come out believing the same thing we do. Yeshua, Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. Wow. Well, there's so much more to cover with you, Dr. Brown, but obviously we can't cover it all in one discussion. Uh, where can people find more about you and see your teachings, find your books? Yeah, askdrbrown.org is the general website, askdrbrown.org. We've got all of our videos there, all of our articles and other things. And then from there, if they just click on Jewish, it'll take them to realmessiah.com. But to get the rest of the story, all the other materials, askdrbrown.org. Great. And to all those uh, Hebrew speakers and readers out there, we have here in Israel, the, uh, Dr. Brown's book, The Real Kosher Jesus, Yeshua HaKasher, Echad Mishelanu, one of us, like you said. Uh, just click on the link in the description of this video and we can send you a copy. We have been sending up actually quite a, a lot of these uh, recently. So uh, you, we can send you a free copy of this book if you uh, click on the link down in the description. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for your time here uh, and, and your sharing your wisdom with us on the Jews for Jesus YouTube channel. My joy. Keep up the great work there. Thank you, Dr. Brown. So don't be afraid to read the New Testament for yourself. I mean, you owe it to yourself after all these years and all those times hearing that it's a book for Gentiles, it's anti-Semitic, it's for the Christians, we have ours, they have theirs. It won't take long before you realize that none of what you were told was true. And all it took was this. Jesus came to unite Jew and Gentile as one in him. So thanks for watching, and don't forget to visit our website at JewsForJesus.org and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. God bless you all.